Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Thank you as always. Let me start with the piece I wrote over the weekend. I said safe havens are priced for Armageddon now. And uh, you can't go f much further than Armageddon. So we're seeing these safe havens, Bitcoin, gold is below 1500, Bitcoin below 10,000. And actually, you know, that is a funny early warning indicator. I consider it a safe haven at the moment. So I'm seeing the safe havens come off the bid and the general theme is, I think, you know, trading sells across the board. For our consolidation of the dollar renminbi, highest level since March 2008, can't see any news, that's Sun Chartist, and uh, we're now above 709. And uh, in several articles I've written, the last one being the feedback loop phenomenon, I said the most important currency to watch right now is the dollar renminbi. This is a great long-term chart from Forex Live of the dollar index, and it's at the highest uh, in a dec more than a decade, but look back and see how much we've actually come off from the highs many, many years ago. Uh, but as I said at the beginning of the year, the direction of the dollar is pivotal and I think the path of least resistance is still higher. Um, I went back to my article where I was quoting Don DeLillo, the specialist is monitoring data, aren't we all, on his mission console, when a voice breaks in, a voice that carried with it a strange and unspecifiable poignancy. I find that so poignant. His, Germany's historic 30-year auction failed, sold a 30-year bond at a record low yield of minus 0.11% for 30 years. That means you're paying above par today and you're going to get redeemed at par and you're going to get nothing in between. But demand was less than a billion euros, way below the two billion euro target. And that's another reason why I'm saying, you know, those safe havens were bid for Armageddon and they've come off that a bit. Honestly, if I ask someone to lend me two billion at minus 0.11% for 30 years and they'll only extend me 869 million at minus 0.11%, you're not going to catch me calling it a failure, the ever uh, pithy birdie word. And that's why this is a Wizard of Oz world and bond yields are in tilt mode. Adam Mancini says there's a setup for a short squeeze in yields to 2.05%, especially with Jackson Hole coming. And uh, I tend to agree with that. Home thoughts. I was never aware of any other option but to question everything. No Chomsky via Literary Vienna, and that took me back to Thomas Pynchon. If they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. I love that. Leopard Sun versus Hyena, Who Will Win? Taken by Lisa King in aid of the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. A mother leopard killed an impala, and six hyenas chased her away from the kill as she was dragging it to the tree, the leopard son decided he was going to get some no matter what. Il Gotapardo, the leopard, a fantastic book. All life is just one home, the earth, and we as the dominant species must take care of it, Dame Daphne Sheldrick, indeed. That took me for some reason to come wish time changes and our desires change. What we believe, even what we are, is ever changing. The world is change, which forever takes on new qualities. 
Political reflections, Italy's Prime Minister resigns, lashing out at the far-right leader Matteo Salvini's habit of kissing the rosary. Um, during his entire presidency, Barack Obama sent out 352 tweets. Donald Trump is now at 43,600, Pete D'Souza. And uh, I was writing about Trump in July, and I was talking about the showdown between him and the four Democratic congresswomen. And uh, in that, uh, uh, I was quoting another friend of mine from social media who told me that there is a reason Trump tweets. It gives him Pavlovian control over the narrative, but in order to achieve that, it's got to be really rat-a-tat-tat. -tat. Now, he's been saying like he's the king of Israel, they love him like he is the second coming of God, but American Jews don't know him or like him. They don't even know what they're doing or saying anymore. It makes no sense, but that's okay. If he keeps doing what he's doing, he's good for. Donald Trump just said, I am the chosen one. Uh, J.Y. Sexton says, make no mistake, his push to forward the narrative that he's a messiah isn't an accident. It's a strategy for 2020 and an escalation in vilifying his opponents. This is beyond dangerous in a way that's hard to overstate. Some people think he's playing chess when actually his aides are trying to stop him from eating the pieces. Um, speaks for itself, but I tended to find from Shakespeare, which I studied when I was 11 onwards, hubris always undoes everybody. Z's choice, destroy Trump or save him and weaken America. The Washington Post, the clip is via Howard French. And this is why I wrote over the weekend, Z Yingping is signaling he has control of the console. This is China, as per Teresa A. Fallon. And indeed, China is rising. Um, as I said, what is clear is that Xi Jinping has repelled the US advance. And this past week's one renminbi price action was a message delivered with finesse and subtlety, and whose import cannot be ignored. Now, where is it? 709 and change. And the point for me is that the renminbi is now the catalyst. China has signaled it will be a shock absorber, and he has signaled he has control of the console. I called it the feedback loop phenomenon. Tariff wars, who blinks first, I asked on the 9th of July last year. Sometimes it isn't the economy, stupid Bloomberg opinion. Talking about Hong Kong and Kashmir, poverty isn't the primary force behind unrest in either place. It isn't the economy, stupid, whether in Hong Kong, Kashmir, Ohio, or the British Midlands. The deeper issue is identity. Protesters in both Kashmir and Hong Kong are worried about losing what little autonomy they've enjoyed until now. They see distant central governments encroaching upon limited freedoms that they have long taken for granted. Kashmir is an even starker example of this. Among, although the state's former autonomy had been rendered almost meaningless over time, its removal means that the residents of the Kashmir Valley must now admit their absolute lack of control over their political destiny. Further, subs further subsidies from New Delhi to Kashmir help. The valley may be underperforming, but it is still doing pretty well by Indian standards, at least in terms of economic outcomes. I wasn't aware of that. Surely Modi of all people should understand that young Kashmiris aren't on the streets throwing stones because they're angry about being left behind economically. He won this year's general election in spite of a stalling economy, precisely because he outplayed the opposition on identity politics. I think this is an important point. His genius, and it's actually symptomatic across the globe, his genius was to instill in his voters, especially upper caste 
uh, Hindu men, the sense of empowerment he is stripping from Kashmiris. It's worth pointing out that these are global trends, and the 2016 Brexit referendum remain as warnings about the economic costs of exiting the European Union proved far weaker than Levy's appeals to English identity. Key point, I think. In this third decade of the 21st century, politicians everywhere need to recognise that illusions about economic palliatives or class solidarity are just that, illusions. As I wrote on the 19th of August when I was talking about Kashmir and Hong Kong and Taiwan and plenty of other frontiers, I said the periphery is a tinderbox in many parts of the world. China on Wednesday, here we go to another periphery, blasted a huge planned U.S. armed shipment to self-rule Taiwan and threatened to sanction firms involved in the sale of F-16 fighter jets. The sale is a serious interference in our internal affairs and undermines our sovereignty and security interests. As I said, the frontier from Xinjiang to Kashmir, from Gaza to Crimea, from Hong Kong to Taiwan are 21st century flashpoints. Of course, there are many other frontiers, the Mediterranean Sea, the Sahara Desert Islands, because of the economic exclusion zones they control. Kashmir under lockdown, this is a whole series of pictures by Reuters. Mad respect for Cathay Pacific CEO Rupert Hogg. Read this from Ray Redacted. I remain of the view it's not possible to Xinjiang, Hong Kong, I think. And on that point, this is Joshua Wong's tweet, I for Hong Kong campaign. He's been a sophisticated uh, adversary. As I said, uh, this is a sophisticated response. I was talking about uh, those folks in Hong Kong trying to do a bank run, uh, but ultimately it speaks to the sophistication of the protesters in Hong Kong, in my view. Tweet, Twitter helps China push agenda abroad despite banning mainland. This is interesting. Twitter removed hundreds of accounts linked to the Chinese government this week meant to undermine the legitimacy of Hong Kong protests. We know China is adept at controlling domestic information, but now they're trying to use Western platforms like Twitter to control the narrative on the international stage. Well, if Trump is going to use Twitter to deliver his message to the Chinese government, then it makes perfect sense China should be using this medium to send the signals back. And that took me back to uh, something I wrote in September 2012, but referencing uh, 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 the Army War Journal of 1997. One of the defining bifurcations of the future will be the conflict between information masters and information victims. Information warfare will not be couched in the rationale of geopolitics, but will be spawned like any Hollywood drama out of raw emotions, hatred, jealousy and greed, emotions rather than strategy, will set the terms of information warfare struggles. Then Pepe Grillo, this is the deflagration of an epoch, it's the apocalypse of this information system, of the TVs, of the big newspapers, of the intellectuals and of the journalists. This is over the top publishing. There is a world war. There is already a war on China. There has been a war of attrition against Russia. Breaking up the Russian Federation is a US objective. John Pilger, RT, interesting interview, which goes back to that article in October last year where I wrote, War is Coming. He says we're in a war situation, the episode 788 RT underground action Ratansi. Iranian president says if oil, ex oil exports, Iran's oil exports are brought down to zero, then international waterways will not have the same security as before. He's been saying that since the beginning. June 2019, I was quoting Stratfor, who said the overwhelming confidence that Iran is displaying both in rhetoric and action is astounding. It is to me too, but nevertheless, as I wrote in May, they remain at the edge. There is no honest way to explain it. 
because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over. International markets Boris Johnson accused the EU of being a bit negative. I love this very super positive Boris that he's got going. It's really terrific. About prospects of reaching a Brexit deal, the UK Prime Minister says he believes we'll get there and has promised to go at it with a lot of oomph. He really has. He's overwhelming politically at the moment. A no-deal Brexit looks increasingly inevitable with the UK entering a shallow recession next year, according to Barclays. Um, base case uh, is that uh, currency might drop as low as 109. Delivering Brexit without an extension beyond October 31st is seen by 10 Downing Street as a political imperative. In order to break up, in order to prevent a breakup of the Conservative Party and pave the way for its future electoral victory, as I said in August, as I watched the pound fall like a stone, I could not help wondering if the sterling, if this sterling moment is precisely like it was in 1992. Can he self-eject Britain? Can he be stopped? This is a political calculation. I'm of the view he can self-eject, and that's the point, which I think is important. Uh, let's go to the currency markets. Euro dollar 110.93, doing a lot of work around here, teetering on the precipice, I kind of feel. Dollar index 98.225, Japanese yen. This is another interesting currency, 106.37. I'm thinking of buying options 110 one, uh, and 100. Uh, you know, one touch. Uh, Swiss franc point 9820, the pound, a little bit firmer. I wonder what Macron's saying, 121.48. The Australian dollar, 0 0.76, 0 0.6765. Uh, the new Kiwi dollar is very weak, below 64. India rupee, 71.75. South Korean one, 1206.69. Brazilian real, still above 440259. Egyptian pound, where they're all expecting a rate cut today. Let's keep an eye on that. 16.60 in the rand, a little bit of an oversold bounce, 15.215. This is a dollar index chart from Simple Trends, and I tend to agree with him that we're headed higher. This is a euro dollar chart. As I said, you can see we've been hugging this area of 111. Uh, we're just below it now for quite a while. Bitcoin, which for me is a, is a gold, it's a safe haven play, it's utility, it's not proven at all. But as a safe haven, we're now at 9,000, we're below 10,000. So that's what I meant about coming off the boil. Commodity markets, gold, below 1,500. I think we're going to retrace quite sharply. Crude oil, $55.87. Saudi Arabia warns against dealing in virtual currencies, including so-called crypto real. That's by Ahmed. And that uh, took me back to the zeitgeist of the time, is its defining spirit or its mood. Capturing the zeitgeist of the now is not an easy thing because we're living in a dizzyingly fluid moment. Gladwell stated ideas and products and messages and behaviours spread like viruses do. I used to be called Captain Chainsaw, President Bolsonaro said. Now I am Nero setting the Amazon up aflame. These are apocalyptic images of Brazil. Sub-Saharan Africa demonstrators in Malawi say they will go ahead with planned protests as President Mutharika vows to deploy the military. This is the Tipex election, which was narrowly won, apparently, by President Mutharika, but um, Malawi does not have a history of uh, street protests, which have been persistent. Sudan's newly appointed Prime Minister, Abdullah Handok, has been sworn in. In his first presser after taking the oath, the Prime Minister said the immediate focus of the transitional government would be ending civil wars. Um, uh, the SRF just hours before renewed their rejection to the agreement. I've written about it severally. 29th of July, I characterised it as the Ood Spring in Khartoum. 
Um, I said the zeitgeist of the revolution in Khartoum was intoxicating as I watched the events unfold. It felt like Sudan was a portal into a whole new normal. Hugh Masekela said, I want to be there when the people start to turn it around. And I said, Sudan is a Masekela pivot moment. This photograph from KPC Zim near Norton on the main Bulawayo to Harare Road. How smaller states are choosing sides in the Indian Ocean defence. One, from Sri Lanka to Kenya, governments try to balance major power influence except in arms purchases. As India and China have intensified their geopolitical interests in the Indian Ocean, the region's smaller states have aimed to balance their political relations with these major powers. But in at least one realm of engagement, countries have resisted balancing their relations. Since 2015, the island countries of Mauritius, Seychelles, Sri Lanka have procured military equipment only from India, while the coastal countries of Bangladesh, Djibouti, Kenya, Myanmar, Pakistan and Tanzania have bought slowly from China. Strategic significance of the area's island states, notably Sri Lanka, Mauritius, Maldives and the Seychelles, arises primarily from their proximity to, inter to key international sea lanes. Uh, Add in those EEZs. China, India, Japan and the US each have some cooperative but otherwise mostly competing interests and projects in these states, largely for capacity building. The Indian Ocean, the precocity of the Indian Ocean, as a zone of long-range navigation and cultural exchange is one of the glaring facts of history, made possible by the reversible escalator of the monsoon wind, Professor Felipe Fernandez Amesto. August 2013, I said, I have no doubt that the Indian Ocean is set to regain its glory days, in part because the Indian Ocean region is expected to become the geostrategic center of gravity in the new Cold War, that's Andrew Corribico. August last year I was writing about the Indian Ocean economy in a port race um, and to note, have a listen also to an interview I did with Maria Howe Lopo de Cavallo about Louis de Camoix and her book which followed his 16th century journey from Portugal all the way to Macau, Cape of Good Hope, Mozambique, all the way around. Really interesting. South African oil shares up 3.61% year to date. Dollar rand, six month chart, rand getting a little bit of a reprieve, but it's just an oversold bounce. Egyptian pound, this is what we've got to keep an eye on. Last at 1660.87. EGX30 has gained more than 7% this month, making it the world's best performing major gauge of those tracked by Bloomberg. Um, that's in stark contrast to declines in peers with MSCI Emerging Markets Index falling 5% five month, five month to date. A decision from the nation's monetary policy committee is due Thursday, with the benchmark overnight deposit rate expected to be cut by at least 100 basis points to 14.75%, according to 10 out of 12 analysts surveyed by Bloomberg. President al-Sisi and I, for one, disagree with him on many things, particularly with his incarceration strategy, did make bold moves when it came to the economy, devalued the currency early, took a brutal punch to the solar plexus, and is now reaping the dividend from its bolder economic policy, particularly when you compare it with Nigeria, where the, that currency looks as if it's set to break. EGX30 is up 10.14%. Year to date. Happening now, this is from Dr. Rafiq Raji, that was yesterday, Nigerian President Buhari inaugurating his cabinet in Abuja. The election, if I'm not mistaken, was in February. And in February, I wrote about the election and I was quoting Ben Okri, who said, We dream of a new politics that will renew the world under their weary, suspicious gaze. There's always a new way a better way that's not been tried before. Nigerian oil shares down 12.97% year-to-date in one of the worst performing markets. 
during Buhari's uh, tenure, you would have halved your money in dollars. Ghana Stock Exchange down 8.11% year to date. Two Congolese companies announced last week the discovery of an oil field in Oyo, Republic of Congo, estimated at 359 million barrels. Um, it's created a stir, but for the moment there's little precise information. If proven correct, it would almost triple the daily oil production of the Republic of Congo. That's interesting. Jamia has identified improper transactions at the Africa-focused online retailers' Nigeria business that has amounted to as much as 4% of first quarter sales. Uh, this is something that they were accused of by Citron Research, indisputable evidence of fraud. Uh, Jumia found cases where improper orders were placed and subsequently cancelled. Transactions in question amounted to 2% of 2018 gross merchandise volume, term for sales used in online retailing, rising to first 4% in the first quarter of 2019. Frankly, Nigeria, that's not a bad result, but that's a cynical call. Stock shed another 14% to $12.73 dropping below the $14.50 listing price, it almost got to $50. The business model has severe vulnerabilities, telemo markets analysts led by Nirgunan Tiru Chalban said in a note, the business is intensely cash flow negative and we have concerns about its viability. Have a listen to the video, Jumia induced indisputable evidence of fraud Citron research. Coming to Kenya, micro-lending goes digital, bringing debt distress to the masses. David Malinga in Bloomberg. With no bank account to his name, Jay Barraza still found a lender to finance his passion for gambling on soccer. All it took was a few clicks on his phone and his willingness to pay annual interest of more than 150%. In Kenya's, in Africa's financial technology pioneer, there are now more people keeping money on their phones than in banks. Almost one-fifth of mobile banking borrowers defaulted last year. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa has proven the most fertile ground for micro-lending through mobile devices. In 2018, there were 395.7 million mobile money accounts in the region, or almost half of the world total. The $26.8 billion handled represents two-thirds of the total transactions, according to GSMA, which represents 750 mobile operators. Asia is the closest competitor, with such transactions equivalent to 7% of its economy, compared with about 10% in Sub-Saharan Africa. Finance companies like Tala, which raises money from investors, Tala, whose biggest market is Kenya's dispersed, $750 million in loans between $10 and $300 in the last five years, says its East Africa growth manager, Ivan Moa. For the vulnerable, including young or poor, who may borrow to survive, digital credit is in danger of destroying the very market that feeds it. It's not as bad as it looks, says Talas Boa. Our charges should be looked as, at as total cost of borrowing and not annualized, he said. They are loan sharks on steroids, Central Bank Governor Patrick Jerome said in May. So, as we said, 395.7 million mobile money accounts in Sub-Saharan Africa, almost half of the world total. Coffee auction sales have plunged 25% in the first half to $78.9 million from $105.3 million, but we know coffee prices have uh, here have collapsed from $5.13 in January 2018 to $1.89 in June 2019. That's from Mir. More important really is tea auction sales, um, $476.5 million in the first half of this year versus $633.8 million in the first half of last year. A bunch of results, Co-op Bank reported half-year earnings per share Rose 4.098%, Co-op is down 17.13% year-to-date, trades on a trading PE of 
Total assets up 7.822%. Fees and commissions on loans and advances are up an eye-popping 33.184%. Other fees and commissions up 38.964%. Profit before tax up 6.122%. Uh, earnings per share up 4.098%. Price to book of 1. I think it's reasonable value now. NIC Bank reported only half, half year earnings per share declined 0.355%. Uh, loans and advances to customers net was up 3.071%. Total operating income up 12.52%, loan loss provision up 29.563%, uh, EPS down 0.355%, interim dividend 25 cents a share. Of course, they're in a merger with uh, CBA. Sandland Kenya, oh, look at this, reported first half earnings per share up 141.69%. Gross written premium up 17.496%. Investment and other income up 4,000. No more than that. Good. Yes, 4,548%. Um, they had uh, profit before tax of 937 million versus uh, loss before tax last time of 1.77 billion. So that's a good turnaround. Crown Paints reported first half. EPS was down 28.07%. Headline revenue up 12.769%. Profit before tax up 17.781%. And uh, EPS down 28.07%. PESA Africa retweeted Ochi Rob, Kodak Moan for Nation Media Group. Look at what's happened to the share price. Share price uh, is uh, it's trading on a P of 6.89. Its market cap is about 75 million dollars. Uh, it is a top quality franchise, but we've seen a five-year decline in turnover, EPS, and dividend payout, which is at a decade low. Kenya shilling hanging in there quite well, 103.10. Nairobi all share up 7.21 percent year to date. NSC20 down 12.19% year today. Thank you for stopping by.